Hello, my name is Ariana DeAngelis and I'm the training manager here at The Autism Project. This is the Basics of Autism Updated. And if you'd like to hear more about why we chose to update our original Basics of Autism video, please stick around to the end where I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Now, something to understand about this video, we are going to be talking about the diagnosis of autism, what that diagnosis entails, what characteristics are associated with that diagnosis. But what we're not going to do today is talk about who a person with autism is. Because like all of us, a person with autism is this unique kaleidoscope of skills, challenges, passions that evolves throughout the person's life. Every person with autism is unique and different. So anyone that's in your family, any child or spouse that has autism, any friend or coworker, making connections with them on a personal level will teach you more about who they are. What we're gonna talk about today is the what of autism. What does that diagnosis mean? And I'll provide a few examples for you as well. You'll also hear me switching back and forth between person first and diagnosis first language. So you'll hear me say autistic person or person with autism. There are two camps here or two schools of thought. Some folks don't want to be classified by their diagnosis. So saying a person with autism, putting that person first, and then the diagnosis follows. Others prefer to be categorized by that diagnosis because it's something that represents who they are. So in order to respect both sides, you will hear me flipping back and forth between those two terms. With that, let's get into an understanding of the diagnosis of autism. At the Autism Project, we start all of our trainings with the definition of autism by the American Psychological Association. Now, in thinking about why, it's specifically for that word that you see in bold, neurodevelopmental. Autism is a neurodevelopmental diagnosis. It is not a behavior diagnosis. So when we think about neurodevelopmental, we think about these behaviors we see on the surface from a person with autism or these characteristics that we may see are the result of that individual's neurology and the way that that neurology processes their external environment and their internal environment. So here's an example. I was working in a kindergarten classroom. I was doing a consultation there and I was sitting in the back of the room observing the student I brought in to take a look at. And this little boy was sitting in his desk and he had been sitting for about an hour and 15 minutes. This was right in the middle of COVID so the children weren't able to play as groups and get up and move about the room as much. So he'd been sitting for quite a while. So he started to pound his fist against the desk and he was making a lot of noise. The other kids around him were saying, oh, Joe, you're being too loud. Oh, stop, I can't think. The teacher redirected the little boy as well. Now on the other side of the classroom, there was a little boy with a behavior disorder. Same situation, banging his fist against the desk. The little kids around him were going, oh, Joe, and I used the, the name Joe for everyone just to protect everybody's identity. Joe, you're being too loud. The teacher was redirecting him. And the difference, we saw the same behavior from these two little boys. The little boy with autism was trying to stay regulated. He was trying, he'd been sitting for a long time. He was getting anxious, he was getting antsy, like any kindergartner would, sitting for that long. But for him, it was a unique challenge. His body needed extra movement and extra input in order to stay present and attend to the lesson. So he was feeling anxious and started to pound his fist while looking up at the ceiling and working to stay in his seat, to stay as regulated as he could. The little boy with the behavior disorder on the other side of the classroom was looking around. Who is reacting to me pounding my fist against the desk? How can I get more of a reaction? What if I'm louder? So both little boys, same behavior that we're seeing, but the motivation for that behavior is very different. 
the little boy with autism, his neurology, the way that his brain works led to what we saw on the surface. So, so often our kids with autism and our adults with autism are seen through this behavioral lens. What is she trying to get out of this? Why is he manipulating me? Why doesn't she care? Why aren't they trying harder? But it's not this behavior that we need to address, but rather what's happening below the surface. Once we understand what's going on below the surface, whether it be communication challenges, self-regulation or sensory challenges, medical concerns, social challenges, once we understand what's happening below the surface, we can provide those supports to address the child or the adult's needs. So it's so important. If you, if you hear nothing else <laughs> from this presentation, thinking about switching your perception of folks with autism and looking at them through that neurodevelopmental or neurological lens, and then thinking about what can I do to provide understanding and support. That is key to forming connections with supporting people with autism. Now let's talk a little bit about that autism spectrum. I'm sure you've all heard the term autism spectrum. It's, it's basically part of our vernacular these days. But what does it really mean? There's so much misconception about autism. So in order to understand the diagnosis, we have to have a little bit of historical context. In 2013, the American Psychiatric Association published the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 5, the DSM-5. So prior to 2013, diagnoses such as Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, Rett syndrome, or childhood disintegrative disorder would have been given as a diagnosis. However, in 2013, all of those diagnoses changed to autism spectrum disorder. And now within that, within that ASD diagnosis, you may be assigned a level, depending on, according to the DSM, the level of support required. So you may be level one, level two, or level three. Some diagnosticians, when diagnosing, do not assign a level to the person's ASD diagnosis especially in that early childhood thinking like birth to five range, you likely won't receive a level because there's so much variability within that time period. You may have a child who doesn't speak at all until age four, and then you see this explosion of language. That may impact the level they would be assigned. So you may have a diagnostician who simply does not assign a level, or you may have one that doesn't assign in that early childhood range. But regardless of where that individual falls on the spectrum, there are two core areas of challenge or difference. Social communication and interaction and repetitive patterns in behaviors, interests, and activities. So regardless of where that individual falls, they will have those two areas of challenge or difference. And when we think about those levels that I just talked about, and I said, according to the DSM, those levels are assigned based on level of support. But that doesn't mean that someone with ASD level one just needs a tiny bit of support and someone with ASD level three needs a lot of support, but rather that the supports put in place may be different depending on the individual. The skills, the challenges within those two core areas again, may look different depending on the person. So I've worked, I, I was a, a teacher, a teacher's assistant, a home care worker for over a decade. And in that time, I met a myriad of students and worked very closely with them and with their families. In that time, I worked with students with level three autism, level two and level one of all different ages. So I'm thinking of some of my students who had ASD level three some were entirely non-speaking, and others spoke in one to two word phrases. And then I had other students who used a lot of verbal language. But in thinking about one of my particular students, who I'll call Joe, again, <laughs> to protect his identity, when he was making requests, he would say things like, snack please, juice please, pencil please, one to two words. 
But when he needed help with something, he was able to get up, come over to me and say, help please and indicate what he needed. Now I worked with another young man who had ASD level one, who had probably better spoken language than me, incredibly eloquent. But when he needed to get his needs met, when he needed to advocate for himself or ask for help, he had significant challenge in that area and required support. So though that area of social communication was challenged for both individuals, it looked very different, but both required support. So it's a, a misconception really when we think about level one versus level two versus level three, that someone with level one has just a little bit of autism and someone with level two has a medium amount of autism and someone with level three has a lot of autism but rather that those areas of challenge are different and require different types of supports. So keep that in mind as you're encountering, meeting, teaching, and working with people with autism, that we oftentimes neglect our folks on the level one side, level one and two, with things like, you need to be able to figure this out. This is the real world. You're a teenager, you're an adult, you should know this by now, instead of putting in those supports. So it's so important that we make sure to equally support individuals across the spectrum with those tools that are gonna be most effective specifically for them. At the Autism Project, when we discuss behaviors or characteristics associated with autism, we reference what Eric Schopler and the team at Division Teach, T-E-A-C-C-H, out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, what they termed the iceberg theory of autism. Now, you've, I'm sure you've, you've heard or seen the reference to iceberg theories in other areas and other discussions. But as it pertains to autism, we think about these behaviors that we see on the surface or these characteristics or attributes and how they might be influenced or fueled by what's happening below the surface for an individual with autism. So thinking about areas you see here on this slide, like sensory, self-regulation, cognition, communication or social interaction challenges, all of these characteristics and more may influence what you see on the surface for a person with autism. So if we take medical, medical being another one. I worked with a, a little boy. I started with him when he was three years old. He's now a young man, somehow, unfathomably. <laughs> and he, about three years into working with him, he developed some aggressive behavior, biting, kicking, etc. And it seemed to us, to the neurotypical support team working with him, it seemed to come out of nowhere. It was an abrupt change and we couldn't really find a motivation for it. And it wasn't until he had an episode while in a medical facility that a doctor realized he was experiencing migraines. His pupils were really dilated and the doctor happened to notice that and realize that he was in the midst of a migraine. We, being his neurotypical support team, didn't interpret his aggression correctly. And so we were looking for what is he trying to achieve by being aggressive? How can we fix this? Rather than thinking, what's happening below the surface? What's he experiencing? Either the way that he interprets his external environment or this internal environment, the pain he's experiencing. But having difficulty with communication, he was non-speaking, so he couldn't tell us he was in pain. And so that aggression was a symptom of what he was experiencing, that intense pain. So that's really a combination there of a medical challenge and a communication challenge that led to the behaviors we see on the surface. I worked with another student and she had a lot of difficulty when she was coming in after recess. And so right after recess, right after we'd been outside for half an hour, she would come in and she would have what we classify as a meltdown. She would be crying, sometimes she would hit her head, almost inconsolable. What, what can we do? And just with trial and error, we tried all of these different things. And one day she picked up a pair of sunglasses that was in this little sensory bin we had. And she put the sunglasses on, 
wore them outside, came back in, and her, her reaction once coming back in from recess after being out in the sun with sunglasses was much smoother. And we realized in that moment that she was sensitive to the sunlight. So in thinking about that sensory piece, she wasn't able to explain to us that she was sensitive to it. We were taking her outside every day, not realizing and not recognizing those signs. And then she was having a hard time with her self-regulation when she came back in because of that sensory overwhelm. So that led to what we see on the surface. And in preventing that meltdown, we proactively supported her sensory needs through the implementation of those sunglasses. And it's so important here to note, if you have any questions about self-regulation or sensory challenges, please reach out to an occupational therapist because they will provide a wealth of information for you. In the same way, if you have questions about communication challenges, absolutely speak to a speech language pathologist. If you have questions about medical, speak to a doctor. So please bring in all of these different professionals to help you support the autistic people in your life. In thinking about social interaction challenges, there are, are many different areas within social interaction. There's that initial reciprocal back and forth. When you first meet someone and you're sort of exchanging information about each other, Hi, my name is Ariana. I live in Rhode Island. What's your name? What do you do? Having that back and forth can be really challenging for a person with autism. Or you may have a person with autism who's really successful with that initial back and forth, but may have challenges maintaining friendships and relationships. I can think about a young man that I worked with here at the Autism Project, and we were at our summer camp. And he went up to another camper he'd never met before and said, Hi, my name is Joe, and I really like Minecraft. Do you like Minecraft? And the other camper did, and they had this fabulous interaction for about, I would say, 40 minutes, <laughs> going back and forth about what they knew about Minecraft. And, of course, it all went right over my head. <laughs> but it was this great connection. The next day, he came back and reintroduced himself and began talking about Minecraft and talking about the same topics he had talked about the day before. It was his area of high interest and he had these great scripts going for how to discuss it and how to talk about it. But then shifting to something else was challenging for this camper. And so that connection between the two of them unfortunately dissipated and the other camper went and connected with someone else. So that can be a challenge. That maintenance of relationships can be a challenge. Another challenge in the area of communication is nonverbal communication. So I'm using so much nonverbal communication right now. I am looking at the camera. I'm, <laughs> I always get self-conscious when I start to talk about it, but I'm using my hands. I'm enunciating my words and I'm changing the volume and the tone of my voice. If I was giving you this same content, but I was like this and kind of leaning back and you can't really hear me, if I was interacting with you in that way, your interpretation of me as a presenter, of the content that we are discussing, is completely different. So my ability to use nonverbal communication influences the way that you perceive me and you perceive the content. Not only that, but my ability to read nonverbal communication significantly influences my social interaction. So another example, I was working with a young lady who she was having a conversation with a classmate and then that classmate became disinterested and turned her back and started talking to someone else behind her. And the young lady that I was working with continued the conversation to that person's back because she had misinterpreted that nonverbal cue and didn't realize that that person was no longer invested or interested in that conversation. So these areas can be significantly challenging for a person with autism. When we talk about cognitive challenges, thinking about things, different ways of thinking. So executive functioning can be challenging. And that is a really broad term. Planning, 
organizing, time management, shifting from plan A to plan B, working memory, all of that falls under executive functioning. But those specific areas can be challenging for a person with autism. Keep in mind that it can be challenging for all different types of people. It can be challenging for folks with ADHD. I'm sure all of us watching this video, I know I <laughs> can attest to the fact that there are areas of executive functioning that I have challenges with. You do not have to have a diagnosis of autism to have challenges in any of these areas. But just keep in mind that people with autism may experience these challenges and require support. So all of these different areas that we've discussed can influence those behaviors we see on the surface. And when we understand that again, it's the way that that person's neurology is interpreting, processing, and reacting to the external and the internal environment, and that leads to behaviors. Once we have that understanding, then we can put or begin to put appropriate supports in place. We are still learning all about the different components of autism and what those components may look like in different individuals. Dr. Stephen Shore, who has autism himself and is a professor at Adelphi University, and I immediately Google him. I recommend if you, if you haven't heard about him. He's incredible and so insightful. And he is credited with saying, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And what he means by that is every person with autism is different. The characteristics that that person exhibits will be different from other people with autism. The supports required and the professionals required to provide them will likely be different as well. But starting here, starting from a place of understanding about these behaviors and how they may be motivated can be incredibly impactful for assisting a person with autism. Now we've touched a bit on the communication and social interaction components, that first area of difference or challenge for people with autism. And that second area, those repetitive patterns and behaviors, interests and activities can look again, very different for different individuals. So you may see an extreme attachment to routines and patterns and reliance on predictability. But when I say that phrase, extreme attachment, it's also important to note that people with autism benefit from predictability. We all benefit from predictability. But for people with autism, having a routine is very important. Having a predictable routine and teaching the concept of change where appropriate is incredibly impactful. There's this sort of old school way of thinking that we need to teach people with autism flexibility by constantly changing up what's on their schedule and, and having unexpected things pop up so that that person can learn to adjust. But we now know what, through research and through speaking with and learning from autistic people, we now know that predictability is incredibly important for that person. Using schedules and using visual supports depending of course on the person, but that can be incredibly impactful. And when there is a change, providing as much advance notice as possible, again, can be really helpful. Schedules and routines can teach flexibility, but exposing the person constantly to change and unpredictability in their life can actually lead to a significant increase in anxiety. Again, under that umbrella of those uh, repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, and activities, you may see what Dr. Barry Prezant and David Finch call enthusiasms. So that may be an attachment to a particular topic or a particular concept. I worked with students, one had an attachment to or an enthusiasm for Disney movies. Another had an enthusiasm for trains. And I was able to structure my lesson plans using those high interests to allow the child to become invested in what we were talking about. But what may become challenging 
is if those enthusiasms become disruptive or even unsafe. So for example, a child who is really interested in trains and we create train lessons and train math and train stories and think about the vocational track we can put that child on to work in the train or transportation field, that can be fabulous. But if that child or adult is so focused on trains, especially in periods of high stress, then they may take it to a place where it could be unsafe. A child who may leave the home and go to a train station to observe those trains. So it's something to be aware of. It can be really wonderful. People with autism can form social groups around these high interests. It can be an incredible benefit. But it is also important to recognize when it may be a challenge and again to put those supports in place. The person with autism, we talked a bit about sensory previously, but may have areas where they are hyper reactive to sensory input or hypo reactive, hypersensitive or hyposensitive. So you may see an over responsivity to sensory input. Could be visual stimulation. We talked about lights, but it could also be a lot of things in the visual field. Auditory stimulation. It could be tactile, it could be touch, the feeling of certain fabrics. It could be taste, it could be smell. It could be challenges with vestibular, your sense of balance, or proprioceptive, your muscles, your joints, your ligaments. Or it could be interoceptive challenges, those feelings that your body, your internal organs are giving you back. Feelings of illness or pain or hunger, thirst, the need to go to the bathroom. They may be hyper reactive or over responsive and giving you too much feedback or under responsive. You may be a person with autism who doesn't feel hunger or thirst or the need to put on a coat because it's too cold or to take one off because it's too hot. Each individual with autism may be hyper responsive or hypersensitive to certain sensory input and hyposensitive to other sensory input. A young lady that I work with is hypersensitive to auditory input. So certain sounds are really difficult for her, but she is hypo responsive or hypo sensitive to parts of her interoceptive sense. So she doesn't feel pain in the same way. And she actually broke her arm, but didn't seem to react to the pain. And in fact, when she went into the doctors, the doctor had her do different motions, different movements with her arms. And he told this young lady's mother she wouldn't have this range of motion if her arm was broken because she couldn't tolerate this level of pain. And her mother insisted just give her an x-ray and sure enough it was broken, but she didn't experience pain in the same way. So there are so many different components of autism. And again, each individual is different and all of the different characteristics I've spoken about today may or may not apply to the people that you know, the people that you love, the people that you support in your day-to-day -day life, or the person that you are if you have a diagnosis of autism. And please know, as I've gone through all these different characteristics, I have spent over a decade of my life learning from people with autism. And my students, my autistic students, truly are the greatest teachers of my life. And I am privileged now to sit here with all of you today and share their stories and their experiences as I understand them. And as I go through this role as training manager at the Autism Project, I will continue to update this video as I learn more, as I understand more, and as I am given more information from the autistic community. The more I learn from them, the more my language about autism changes, the more the way that I describe autism changes, and the more that the way that I understand autism evolves. The way that I support people with autism evolves. So the way that I understand it today is not how I understood it back when I was working as a paraprofessional at 19 years old. And I'm 35 today, <laughs> just to give you an idea. So each of us within this community is evolving in our understanding. And it's so important for me as a professional, especially as a neurotypical professional, to continue 
to revise the way that I discuss autism, the way that I interact with all of you and share what I've learned. So I thank you sincerely for joining me today. And I thank most of all the autistic community who shares their experiences with me and with the world at large every day. If you have other videos you'd like us to make, please leave them below in the comments. Let us know what you'd like to see and we will be more than happy to provide. And thank you very much for your time. We hope you all have a wonderful day.